Hello everybody, I'm Ellen Scroggins, the adult programmer at the Faulkner County Library, coming to you with another episode of Cookbook Corner. I'm super excited about this one because we are finally in spooky season, which is one of my favorites. So today we're going to be making jack-o'-lantern orange flavored cookies from Let's Bake Halloween Treats by Ruth Owen, a cookbook that can actually be found in our junior section. So buckle up and we're gonna teach you how to make some delicious little cookies. So let's get started. I'm so excited to be doing our spooky Halloween episode with our jack-o'-lantern cookies. So these are actually pretty basic. There's a few different components, but each component is pretty easy to make. So what you're gonna need is you need flour, powdered sugar, an orange, some butter, your bowl and a wooden spoon, and a zester. And this is just for part one. We'll go over what you need for part two when we're ready for that. So the first thing you're gonna to, going to wanna to do is get five tablespoons of butter. Put those into the bowl. Get your half a cup of powdered sugar. You want to be careful when getting it out because powdered sugar can go everywhere very fast. And the fun thing about using powdered sugar in a cookie dough instead of regular granulated sugar is that it can make the cookies much lighter and give them um, a slightly kind of higher sweetness. So what you're gonna wanna do, this is, can be a little difficult. It's gonna take some elbow grease. And it's really good if you can let your butter soften all the way to room temperature before doing this. But you're gonna wanna beat the butter and sugar together with your spoon. And if you're an adult watching this, you might be thinking, why don't you use a mixer? But this recipe is actually designed to be kid friendly. And so that's really how it's, it tries not to, avo uh, to avoid any power tools or any like sharp things. You only use a knife very slightly um, and kids can always have an adult do that if they need to. And so that's why it takes a little more manual power to make this recipe. So as you can see, you're trying to get the uh, butter and the powdered sugar really incorporated in there. And my butter was a little bit chilled. It wasn't very hard, but it was just a little, so it's gonna take a little more time to incorporate in. But you just keep going until they're kind of a nice crumbly paste consistency. Now that you've gotten it to a nice smooth and fluffy consistency, uh, as you can see, the butter and the powdered sugar are very thoroughly combined. We're gonna set that aside and move on to the next step. So after you've washed your orange, always wash fresh produce from the store. Um, as you can see, make sure to take off any stickers or anything like that. And then you're going to need a zester, which is basically just a very special kind of grater with very fine holes. Some of your stand-up four-sided graters will have a zesting side on them, but not all of them do. And then to zest a piece of fruit, you want to get the colored parts off the skin. Use kind of careful, even motions. You're gonna to wanna to do it directly over wherever you want the zest to go. So I'm putting it in a bowl so it doesn't go everywhere. And you're going to zest it until you see those white spots. You can see um, it's gotten kind of a lighter orange, a yellow, and then a little bit of white in the center. You want to stop when you see white. That is called the pith, and it is very bitter. Um, the, the zest of the fruit has the oils in it that carry some of the iconic flavor, which is why we like getting it out. So you're going to want to zest the whole orange. It might take a little while, but it shouldn't be too bad once you get the hang of it. 
And if you've never zested something before, you might want to do like a couple of goes and then check to see how far down you are. You don't need to put a lot of pressure on this. It takes very little to get the zest off. And so when you're just about done zesting, you're gonna see it's, you might have a little bit where you think, oh, I could get that, but it's okay if there's a couple spots of skin left. Um, you do wanna make sure to be very careful when you're using a zester because um, the little spikes on it are very sharp and they could easily scrape up your skin if you accidentally touch it while you're going. So it's just like any other kitchen tool, just like any knife or anything, just be very careful while you're using it. So once you're done with that, you can use, uh, you could use like a spoon or a knife or you can use your finger to kind of scrape any extra zest off as long as you wash your hands, make sure they're clean. All right, so now that you've got your zest all ready and your butter and your powdered sugar are all creamed together, you're gonna go ahead and get your flour. You need one and a half cups of that. Make sure they're roughly level, it's okay to shake it off. There's some, some people have pretty big opinions about how to measure your flour into your measuring cup. Um, really, as long as you're careful and you don't like pile it on top, you're probably gonna get fine results. Unless you're baking like professionally or something, it's not gonna make a big difference. Sometimes flour can get a little compacted at the bottom of the bag, so it takes a little bit to get it out, but we're good. There we go, and then three, so that's one and a half cups. And then you get that zest from your orange into the bowl as well. And we're gonna mix those all together. Now anyone who's made cookies before might notice that this dough seems pretty different because there's very little moisture in it. But if you put enough uh, work in mixing it, you do wanna try not to be too um, aggressive because you can over mix the dough. But as long as you're careful and put the effort in, it should turn out fine. And we want a stiffer dough because these are shaped cookies. And so if they're going to be holding their shape, they need to have a stiff base dough and we're going to need to refrigerate them, which is the next step. And you can see when you first start mixing it together, ooh, be careful not to spray flour everywhere. Um, it looks almost like it's just flour, but as you keep going, you're gonna start to notice little crumbs coming up. And that's a good sign that uh, your ingredients are incorporating well. And depending on the size of your orange, you might be able to like really clearly see the zest. Mine was a little smaller, so it's kind of disappeared in there, but that's okay. It doesn't need to be visible to give that beautiful flavor in. Now, if you've been mixing for a while and your dough is not really coming together, that's okay. There's all sorts of reasons why a dough might wind up a little too dry. Um, it could be that you just put a little extra flour in by accident. It could be that your orange was smaller so there wasn't as much oil from the zest. There's all sorts of reasons. So what you can do is you can skip ahead a little bit in the recipe and what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut our orange in half. And this is called um, a couple things, a citrus a juicer or a citrus reamer. So you just fit it in there. If it doesn't completely fit, you'll just have to be careful. But then you just press down and you can readjust after you squished it a little bit. And you're gonna juice that orange. And it's gonna look pretty mangled, but that's okay. And we're gonna set that aside. Now remember that this dough is very finicky. It takes very little to make a difference. So I would recommend adding a teaspoon of juice at a time. That's gonna seem like nothing, but it could easily make all the difference you need. And this is not strictly speaking in that recipe book, but again, sometimes you just come across something that's a little different uh, from what you expected. That's what you need, because you can see how my dough is almost a sandy texture, and that's, that's too dry, because you can't work with it. So I'm gonna mix this now and see if that juice was enough. If not, we'll add another teaspoon and go from there. Because again, it can tip from too dry to too wet very quickly, and you can always put more liquid in, but you can't take it back out. Well, this is already better, but I'm thinking it's still a little bit too dry. So I'm gonna go ahead and grab another teaspoon of juice. 
right, we're gonna get just a little more. It's getting hard to get out of the bowl. So this is actually more like a teaspoon, but I could only fill it halfway because the not a lot of juice left in that bowl. But this will probably be enough or very close to it. Because yes, it's already getting much crumblier than it was. So you can see we've only put about three teaspoons of juice in and it's already getting significantly better. Let's see if we can get just a little bit more in there. Careful. I'm gonna put two in, cause I just feel like my dough is really thirsty right now. I'm just in the second half of the orange. Um, my dough turned out pretty dry, which is okay. Things happen. Last thing, this isn't Food Network. You know, we don't have people who've been cooking for 20 years here. This is for everybody at home. And sometimes at home, you gotta improvise. We follow the recipes as closely as we can, but you just have to do what's right for you. So we are gonna use more of this, but we need to save a little bit for the end of the recipe. So if we wind up where our dough is still too dry, we might just add a little plain water to it to make sure we have enough orange juice left for the, uh, to finish the recipe with. All right, so we've had to add a pretty good amount of liquid. Um, but that's okay. And as you can see, it's starting to get much more crumbly, starting to come together. There's still a little bit of dusty bits, but that's okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start kneading the dough in the bowl with our hands. So again, you got to make sure you have clean hands for this. And you see it coming together. And it's coming together pretty well. Once you've got it together pretty well, where there's not as many crumbs going on and the moisture has started to really absorb into the dough better, you're gonna actually wanna put it out onto um, a clean counter or some parchment paper or a mat like I have here. Um, anything that is clean and not gonna uh, get the dough sticky. And you're gonna knead it with your hands. Now, kneading cookie dough is a little different than bread dough, but it's actually got kind of a similar concept. What you're gonna wanna do, you fold it up and over, and then you push it with the heel of your palm, and then you just kinda of turn it, push it, and do the same thing again. And you don't wanna knead it for too long, because again, you can overwork the dough, and then your cookies are gonna be really tough uh, and kinda of like crunchy, not crispy, not chewy, um, and so you want to make sure, but you want to make sure your dough has come together. Once you have a dough that seems to be kind of holding its own, see that's all pretty well together. Then you want to use plastic wrap. I actually ran out of plastic wrap recently, so I'm going to use parchment paper. This is like wax paper, but without the actual wax covering. So you're just going to wrap that up. Roll it over, and then you're gonna put this in the refrigerator for an hour, just to let the dough kind of settle, ab finish absorbing that moisture, and really come into its own structure. All right, now that we've let our dough chill in the fridge, we're gonna start rolling out and baking those cookies. So if you haven't already, make sure that your oven is preheated to 350 degrees. So then what we're gonna do, you need to prepare a surface. You can get a mat like I have, or you can just clean off a countertop very thoroughly. Um, or you can lay out a piece of, of parchment paper. But you're gonna wanna lightly flour it. And this will help keep the dough from sticking and kind of take up any extra moisture that might be in it. Unwrap your dough. Remember that it's better to um, wrap it in cling wrap, but I didn't have any, so I used uh, parchment paper like that. If you want, you can flour the top of the dough or even your rolling pin a little bit, and we're gonna just start rolling it out. But we're gonna keep rolling that out until it's about a quarter of an inch in thickness. Once you've been 
rolling your dough out for a while. It should get more pliable and start getting much easier to roll. Do your best to make sure you have a very stable place because that's what I'm struggling with right now, which is all right. So remember, we're rolling this out to about a quarter of an inch in length or not in length, sorry, a quarter of an inch in depth. So that's how thick it's gonna be. And if you put a little more moisture in your cookies, um, you might have a little bit of an easier time rolling it out, but they might not keep their shape as well in the oven. Rolling dough like this tends to be a really good workout for your biceps, but yeah, you'll be able to really feel it. This is a workout, but it helps you uh, burn off some calories before you start eating some. And it's worth it getting that delicious homemade uh, from scratch. With some recipes, there's just no replacing that uh, home taste. And as you can see, we're getting pretty close here. Our dough is starting to thin out really nicely. Um, you can tell we're working with a really stiff, drier dough because of those edges that are all crackled like that. But that's all right, because we're gonna be cutting from the center. Now this might be a tiny bit thick, but I think it's very close to what we're looking for. I'm gonna do just a little extra rolling out here at the end, and then we'll be ready to go on to the next step. All right, so once you've rolled out your dough, what you're gonna do next is you're gonna cut it out. Now, how many cookies this makes entirely depends on the size of cutter you choose. The book recommends to use a circle cutter and shape your cookies after, but to cut down a little time, I'm gonna be using a pumpkin cookie cutter. I got this at Hobby Lobby. There's tons of cooking and craft stores, bake stores. Like you could also go online and find one. So you're gonna wanna cut in pairs. Don't end on an odd number. So we've gotten about six shapes cut out of this roll of dough. You can kind of pull the dough out like that and your shapes should be left behind and just carefully. So again, you're looking for just about that thickness. It's about a quarter of an inch. So once you've gotten those out, you're gonna to wanna to kind of try to form your dough back together. Now this is a tricky part, because you don't wanna overwork your dough, but you do need to kind of push it back into a ball so that it's mostly together. And then you're gonna roll it right back out again. This time will be so much easier than your first time. And you are rolling it out to the exact same thickness, same everything as you did the first time around, going for a quarter of an inch thickness. It can be sometimes a little difficult to get the dough to really um, bond back together again, but if you see any problem areas, just kind of focus on them and give them a little extra love. You can always use your hands to push it in together, but really the roller is the best way um, overall to just get it to kind of bond back together and just give it a little focus to those areas. You can always roll some extra dough in their direction or even pull a piece off and put it over there if you need a little extra thickness to make up for having to roll it out a little extra and just roll that onto there. And there you go. See, they're coming together just like we knew they were going to. And this is just about ready again. And always make sure to kind of lift it off, especially when it starts getting a little stickier. You could put a little extra flour down to keep it um, light and not sticking to the mat, or you could just be very careful as you move it, either way. All right, once you've got it rolled back out where it needs to be, I'm trying to pull the cutter out again. And just complete that process uh, until you are out of dough. Once you have your cookies all cut and laid out in your pans, um, make sure to grease your pans with butter or use parchment paper or some other method to keep the cookies from sticking. You're going to choose one half. I have two trays because of the size of my oven, but if you wanna put them on one, one tray, that's fine. Just do half your cookies, and we're gonna add a little extra decoration. Now this is just for fun, but this is what makes them jack-o'-lanterns, not just pumpkins. So you're going to carefully cut out now, if you are doing this recipe with your kids or you're a child doing this with the supervision of an adult, um, you might want to use a butter knife. But if you can be trusted with sharp knives or you're old enough to use them, they can be a little better getting the shapes out more cleanly. 
Of course, if you happen to have one of those fun sets of um, cookie cutters that punches the features out for you, that's even easier. I'm just gonna do nice little smiles for mine and make them very simple. Now this is why we put the dough in the refrigerator. Other than letting it set and absorb all the liquid, it also helps it keep its shape easier in the oven. But once you have gotten that last face finished up, we're gonna put one more little touch of decoration on, which is just to make the lines on the pumpkins. Now this one, whether you're using a butter knife or a sharp knife, it's actually better to use the blunt edge and just kind of press a line down from the top of the cookie, kind of curve it around to the bottom. You can make those lines as deep as you want. You'll want them to be a little deep so that you can see them because if you can barely see them when the cookie is unbaked, they probably won't be visible once they are baked. Um, my recommendation once you've done all your decorating is to kind of very lightly go over the tops of your cookies. Try not to mess the decorations themselves up, but just kind of wipe off any little excess crumbs of dough that have come up during this process. And the other halves are the backs of the cookies, so we leave them like they are. Once you've got them done, you take them to your preheated oven, and you're gonna bake them for about 15 minutes or until they're golden brown. So the first thing we need to do to make the filling is melt the chocolate, and we're going to do that by using a double boiler. If you've never used a double boiler before, it's a very simple technique. All you're gonna need is a small pot with some water in it and some kind of heat proof, preferably glass bowl or container that can set inside. Now I specifically picked one that had a handle on it that goes a little outside my bowl since, I, uh, since this one does not raise above the bottom of the pan. That way I can hold it if I need to because it is outside the radius of the pan but preferably you'd have one that can rest on top of it so that it, it can be, the very bottom can be immersed in the water, but not touching the bottom of the pan. So once you have this set up, you're just gonna wanna pour just enough water in your pot, like I said, to just touch the bottom of your bowl while it's resting in there. And again, make sure your bowl is not resting directly on the bottom of your pot. So once you have that heated up and going, you need to get it where it's just about simmering. You don't want it full boiling. The recipe calls for a heaping tablespoon of chocolate chips, which is my favorite measurement, because that means I can get away with putting in almost as many chocolate chips as I want. Because was that heaping enough for me? Maybe not. So once your water is just about as hot as you need it, you're going to put your chocolate chips into the water. Now one very, very important rule here is you do not want any water getting in the bowl with your chocolate. You're trying to melt your chocolate down here in a tempered way, which basically means that it, uh, when it cools off again, it will be much more workable. And if you weren't going to mix it into anything else, it would have a nice shiny um, finish to it. And if you get any water in with it, it can break it apart, it can mess it up very badly. It's really not that hard to avoid getting water in your bowl, but it is very important that you do make sure to be careful about that. So at first, you're not gonna see a lot of melting, but once it's been in there a little bit, you'll be able to see already those chocolate chips are starting to go. So then you're just gonna stir it. I've got a whisk, you could easily use a spoon. And if your water is starting to boil a little more than you'd like it to, just turn your heat down a little bit like that. And so once you're sure your chocolate is completely melted down, make sure there's no lumps in there, you can turn your stove off entirely. Set that aside until it's cool enough to take care of. And we're gonna move on to the rest of our filling. Now's a good time to check on your cookies. Remember what I said before, that all ovens bake differently. So you've always want to check before just taking them out. And now the recipe says these should turn a nice golden brown and ours are still a little pale, but I'm going to do a very careful tap test to see how they feel. These actually feel okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and take them out now. These ones actually still feel a little doughy, so I might leave them in for just another minute. Now, as I was saying, for your filling, you're gonna need three and a half ounces of mascarpone cheese 
It sounds very fancy, but you can find this at Kroger or at Walmart, and you're gonna need one teaspoon of powdered sugar. So this is eight ounces, so to get three and a half, I'm gonna need just shy of half of this container. Again, I tend to do things, especially for things like fillings or sauces, a little bit by eye, a little bit by heart, but if you want to be careful, feel free to break out that kitchen scale and weigh out the exact amount you need. And we're gonna to need to put all the chocolate in there. Another reason to maybe over uh, measure your chocolate is that it's kind of hard to get all of it out, although you can use um, a rubber spatula is a great way if you do wanna get every last bit out, that'll do it for you. And then we just need the one teaspoon of powdered sugar. Now that we have all those together, I'm gonna check on my cookies again. See, that was not very much time, but it was enough to kind of give them that last little crisping in the oven. So we are setting those aside as well and letting those cool. Now that you've got the three ingredients in there, all you really have to do is mix those together. Mascarpone cheese is kind of like softened butter. At first, it might give you a little bit of resistance, but once you kind of get it going, it'll soften up and cream very nicely. And if you choose to use a whisk, like I do, you might notice the ingredients kind of getting caught in the middle at first, and that's okay. You give it some beating, you give it a little bit of time, and they will work their way right back out. And you can see that very yummy filling as it's coming together. All right. You can see it took very little time with a hand whisk, and that filling has come together with a smooth, uniform color, no lumps, no bits of chocolate or cheese left around. And the recipe says that the consistency should be about peanut butter level. So we're gonna finish making the last component now, which is just the glaze for the top of the cookies. So what we're gonna do is get some of the orange juice uh, from our orange. You're probably gonna wanna reserve about a tablespoon. I actually, since I wound up having to use so much of the juice as liquid in my dough, I just juiced another orange. So I have more than the recipe calls for, but it says to leave a tablespoon. You are also gonna need a half cup of powdered sugar. Now that's the nice thing about glaze. It is very simple. You, most glazes are just a liquid and powdered sugar. Not all, but most. Um, your probably most famous glaze, unlike your basic pound cake, is lemon juice and powdered sugar. Um, other glazes are just water and powdered sugar, and those are very sweet in and of themselves. And all you have to do is, you saw, I put it right in there and you're just gonna mix it together. You can use a whisk or a spoon for this. And you can see that powdered sugar is blending in really well. You can't really over mix a glaze. So it's okay to keep mixing it until you're sure all the lumps are gone. Now mine's still very thin. As you can see, it just pours off that spoon. But that's probably just because I had extra juice than the recipe called for. So I'm gonna put a little more powdered sugar in. And again, on Cookbook Corner, we try in general to go with the recipe. But like I said, uh, glazes and sauces in particular, you can kind of play with a little bit. So I added about a quarter of a cup more there. And we're just gonna see what that gives us. Mix it in nice and thoroughly until we get a smooth glaze. You can already see that one is much nicer. It's still though just a tiny bit thin for my taste. So I'm gonna just put the rest of this. It's probably, it's not even a full quarter cup of sugar, but I'm just gonna put that last little bit in. One good note, and one of the reasons I'm doing this is that glaze always seems thicker in the bowl than it's going to be. So if you find that it's thin in the bowl, it's going to be very thin on whatever you put it on. There, that's much better. I like I like that consistency very well because you can see I peeled it and when I pour it, it lasts on the surface just for a second before going back in. So I like that consistency. Now I'm gonna do one more change. I know like I said, we try to stick with the recipe, but this is for fun. 
because since we're making these for Halloween, I wanna add a little bit of orange food coloring to our glaze. Now, you always wanna use a gel-based food coloring because that is least likely to affect the consistency of whatever you're working with. And as you can see, you don't need much. Look how nice and vibrant orange that already is. And we just added a couple drops. So that is very good. And now we're gonna move on to our last step. So we're at the final step of our cookies now. Make sure you let your, co your cookies cool all the way down to room temperature before you start doing this or your filling and your glaze will melt right off of them. So all we're gonna do now is take a little bit of filling and spread it on the tops of our bottom cookies. Now, at this point, it's really up to you exactly how thick you wanna do things. Um, with sandwich cookies, especially with a filling um, of this consistency, I like to keep it a little thin just so that it doesn't get too messy, but if you like a lot of filling, then you do whatever makes you happy. And so the last thing we're gonna do, this is the fun but tricky part. Um, we're gonna put these back on. Now there's two ways you can put the glaze on. The way the book recommends is to brush it on um, with either a food grade uh, brush. These are very cheap and easy to get. Um, or you could get a silicone one that has the little more individual bristles and that will work just as well. But you could just get a little glaze on there and you just paint it onto your cookie. You definitely wanna make sure not to get too much glaze on them or else it will run everywhere, but that's okay. And that's the way the book recommends you to do it, which is perfect, it's good, it'll get it on there. The other way that I might recommend is you get the bowl, take the cookie and you just dip it in face down, make sure it's dipped well on there and then let the glaze run off of it. Maybe even brush a little bit if you know there's definitely extra glaze on there. Flip it and then you can see it gets it on there really nice and evenly. And then you can just put that right on top. And you can kind of see the difference there. Now it looks really, really stark right now. Um, this will probably look a little better given it some time to set, but I like the dipping method because it keeps it a little more neat and evenly coated. So all you wanna do at that point is just finish doing all your cookies and you'll be ready to eat. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that gives you some fun ideas for your next Halloween party that you're going to or a fun activity you can do with your kids. As a reminder, that cookie recipe came from Let's Bake Halloween Treats by Ruth Owen, which can actually be found in our junior section. Uh, thank you so much for viewing. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and please join us for the next Cookbook Corner. Thank you.